Good afternoon. Here we are on Sunday, first day of the week, and um, so glad to be here with you and for inviting me into your places and spaces. Uh, it's one of those hectic weeks that I found myself in uh, and um, have decided to, to do uh, this video after our worship service this morning. So uh, we are entering now a, into a new series about five weeks long. Uh, we're calling it The Hard Sayings of Jesus. Jesus said some things to his first century Jewish audience that were difficult for them to, uh, to accept, to understand, uh, and in many other ways too. And, and as well, as we consider some of those over the next five weeks, uh, will be challenging, I believe, to us as well. So I hope that you will uh, participate over the next number of weeks until uh, we get through this uh, short five week or so series and then, then we can begin to prepare for the celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, so I just wanted to introduce uh, a couple of fictitious characters. Not my own, author Greg Morris, uh, who often writes for Desiring.org, uh, introduced us to two demons. Uh, one is called Uncle Grim God and his nephew Globdrop. It's not a handful to remember, but let's see if I can do it. And here we find Uncle Grim God responding to his nephew's report concerning his man. And Globdrop reporting on his humiliating defeat. For you see, this, his man, a student in university, had been debating with an atheist roommate. And it seems that he had in some way made the possibility of heaven a reasonable point of fact. However, his uncle, Uncle Grimwood, Grim God, pardon me, see I already messed it up, would have nothing of it and tells his nephew, stand upright, soldier, for all is not lost. Mere reasoning does not frighten us, he goes on to say. For a reasonable God, a reasonable eternity, a reasonable heaven is still no God, no eternity, and no heaven. For a God and a heaven that no one wants are the only ones acceptable to us, my dear nephew, Globdrop. Globdrop, your man, is one who will not struggle past reasonable. He is no one to attempt to enter the narrow gate. He is a few more hours kind of man. His, reasonable, his reasonableness translates to, Lord, give me a few more hours to make my mark on the earth. Give me a little longer to get married and have children. Don't you see, Globdrop? All this kind of Christian talk, all this debating and arguing, reveals that many so-called Christians still consider heaven an intrusion and their decaying bodies and their gray hairs only simply trigger fear. Not an anticipation, pardon me, for what lies ahead. Well, folks, indeed, Uncle Grimgod had schooled his nephew in the secret to get his man back on track. Just convince your man that heaven is nothing to leave earth for. And here's the kicker, no deception required. Simply allow heaven to be reasonable to your man. That's what Grim, Grim God would say. Let them think they are praying, as Morris writes, on earth as it is in heaven, when they really mean in heaven as it is on earth. So please turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 7, and uh, we'll be picking it up in verse 13 to the end. Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 13 to the end. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy, that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. 
A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Verse 28. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teachings. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. God, our Father, our Lord and Savior, we thank you. We thank you for this time that we can be together in this way, through the internet, through different devices. We thank you, Lord, for this technology that brings the gospel into our places and spaces. We thank you for this particular text. We thank you for the Sermon on the Mount, the sermon which Jesus revealed and opened up to the reality of what living in the kingdom is to be, how we are to worship you, O Lord, how we are to interact with each other, how we are to interact with the world around us. We thank you, Lord, for these these uh, wonderful verses that we just read. And we ask by your spirit you help us to uh, allow the word of God to penetrate our hearts and our minds, to teach us, to lead us, to, conf- to shape us and form us to become more and more like your son Jesus. And it's going to be hard in some of these places today, and I pray, God, that we'd be willing to surrender and acknowledge those places that we need to acknowledge and surrender to you. In all this, I thank you, Lord, for the gospel is the good news of salvation. And I pray for each person that is listening or watching or both, God, that you would be speaking to their hearts and minds through this message. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as we spend our time here in Matthew's Gospels, there's a couple of things we need to be prepare ourselves with before we get right into the text. Some things we need to concern ourselves with or to remember. For example, when Jesus was speaking from the Mount, he was addressing a majority audience of Jewish people. You see, his disciples were Jews, and and the crowds around him were Jewish. And this was also a first century Jewish audience. That's the first thing we need to keep in mind. Secondly, as we'll be uh, talking about the doctrine of salvation, the way Jesus approaches it here, we need to know that Jesus' Jewish audience believed they were saved. They believed they were saved because they were descendants primarily of Abraham. And there's more to it. We'll get to that. Thirdly, when we study the text, as a matter of fact, any text of the Bible, we need to keep in mind that we will bring to it our presuppositions, our biases, our cultural perspectives. And the mere fact that we are 21st century citizens can be, if we allow it, a hindrance to understanding the text before us. I've said this before. We've got to put on our first century lens. If we can possibly do that, that would be very helpful. Fourthly, after we set aside our modern biases, we must be very careful not to proof text. And uh, this is really my role as as the pastor to, to push you in that direction because context is a key tool for studying the Bible. Context, context, context is everything. For if we build our understanding of God around a few references, a few texts, we can be sure that we'll get it wrong. And worse, we might even find ourselves in the same camp that Jesus often accused as self-righteous and hypocritical. We have enough of that in the church today. So let's look at verse 13 to 28 overall. And as we do that, uh, as we go through verses by verses here quickly, we will find 
identifiable pattern with these verses from 13 to 28. So let's look at this. Let's go look at verse 13 to 14. And there you'll find uh, two gates and two ways and two destinations and two groups of people. You go to verse 17 and 20. We find two kinds of trees and two kinds of fruit. Verse 21 to 23, we find two groups of people on the day of judgment. And then in verse 24 to 28, we find two kinds of builders building on two different kinds of foundations. So we have established already in this overview that there is a two-way pattern which unifies verse 13 to 29. And probably the major thing that unifies it is the things that Jesus said here in this way. But now that we recognize this two-way pattern in the set of texts here, or references, we need to know some more things. And uh, we need to know some meanings of words. We need to know the meaning of the word narrow that we find here once in verse 13, and once more uh, in verse 14. We want to keep this as simple as possible because it doesn't have to be complicated. The Greek word Matthew used for narrow in the phrase enter by the narrow gate, this is an ESV, is different than the Greek word he used for narrow, which is translated by the ESV, which I just read, as hard. Uh, some might have the NIV and you'll find that the word narrow is there. But this is a different Greek word than the one used in verse 13. The Greek word for narrow in verse 13 is transliterated stenos. And it's used figuratively here, describing the gate as narrow that leads to heaven. We, we kind of sense that already. But why? It is narrow in the sense that it's opposite to our natural inclinations, or otherwise opposite to our sinful nature. We have that in verse 13. But in verse 14, Matthew uses a different word. A different word. It's translated, again, as I mentioned, in the ESV as hard. And this Greek word is transliterated thlebo, thlebo. I'm probably not saying that right, with the right enunciation. And thlebo almost always refers to persecution. And the word is used here figuratively to mean the way of discipleship is narrow, or as one commentator put it, quote, the way of discipleship is restricting because it is in the way of opposition. And this makes sense because the way of opposition is a major theme we find here in the Matthew's Gospel as a whole. And we see this, this opposition as people, as disciples, the disciples uh, in, the, in Acts of the Apostles reveal to us that the way of discipleship is a way of opposition. And let's go to just for, for an example for us, Acts chapter 14. And let's pick up the story when Paul and Barnabas were at Lystra preaching the gospel. And while they were there in Lystra, Jews arrived in town from Antioch and Iconium. The text kind of tells, that tells us that. And these Jews really had one mission. They had the mission to cause trouble for Paul. And they had managed to get the crowds in Lystra all riled up against Paul. And Paul, for preaching the gospel in Lystra, was stoned. And he was dragged out of the city and left for dead. What happened next is, to me, quite mind-blowing. He got back up, he survived that, and went back into Lystra. And the next day, he left with Barnabas and whoever else was with him to preach the gospel in another community called Derby. And when they were down, done in Derby, pardon me, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Now, that, think about that. The very places that they were either you know, chased out of or stoned, they went back there. Why did Paul go back to where he was persecuted, almost killed? Well, let Luke tell us, uh, Acts 14, 21. They, that's Paul and Barnabas and whoever else was with them, returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in their faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Did you catch that? Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And here in our text, the gate which is narrow is the hard way. It is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. 
It's the hard way of verse 14. It's not the way of reasonableness. It's not the easy way of verse 13. So let's take a closer look look at verse 13 at this wide gate. Uh, The easy way that Jesus said many enter into. Many enter into this wide gate. And let's deal with Jesus' first century audience first. We remember the, Jew, the Jewish audience believed they were saved primarily because they, were, they would call themselves the people of God, God's chosen nation. And on the service, one could make a case for this and draw the same conclusion. Yet our text before us does not allow us to come to that conclusion. Uh, or should I say, Jesus would not agree with that assumption. Consider that Jesus' is uh, Sermon on the Mount was the time when uh, he was really mostly at the peak of his popularity. We have to remember that. And his audience would have included his chosen disciples and others who had decided to follow him. And secondly, Jesus was preaching a kingdom of righteousness, holiness, salvation, that he said only a few would enter. You see, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount reveals the true nature of the kingdom of God which is in opposition to the religiosity and the self-righteousness and the work salvation of the Jewish audience he was addressing. Jesus was revealing a deception that his first century Jewish audience had believed, the assumption that they were saved. And Jesus is clear about this, for he tells us here in verse 21 and 33, or he tells the audience on the same, the same audience that we just described, that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then, I, and then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Well, friends, guess the Jews of Jesus' day had the Old Testament. They had the prophets. They had the patriarchs. Abraham and Moses. They had the temple sacrifice. They had the priesthood. They had the covenant. What did they miss? What did they miss? They missed this. Those who will enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, are those who would do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 21. And what is his, and what is his will? Well, We'll look a little closer here at these few verses, but I would suggest that you start with verse 1 of Matthew 5 and read through to the end of Matthew 7, and you will find the Father's will all through there. Jesus' Jewish audience, for the most part, assumed they were saved by the very thing that Jesus condemned, work salvation. You see, his Jewish audience was really revealing their self-deception and their self-righteous attitudes. And, and, and Jesus highlights this by saying this to them, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Of course, he's talking about the, uh, the false prophets, but he's also talking about all of the Jews that believed they were saved by their works. See, Jesus was identifying the fruit of his audience. Jesus here was identifying the wide gate, the easy gate, the way of many in his Jewish audience. And this wide gate includes, as one commentator put it, when we consider the whole thing in the big picture scheme of things, he put it this way, quote, all religions of works and self-righteousness go through the wide gate and all lead to hell, not heaven. So I wonder, have you ever heard the term cultural Christianity? Have you ever heard that term? One commentator helps define this for us, this term, cultural Christianity, by saying this, quote, cultural Christianity is religion that superficially identifies itself as Christianity, but does not truly adhere to the faith. So one who is a cultural Christian is one who wears the label Christian. But the label has more to do with other things, any other thing, other than a personal conviction that Jesus Christ 
is their Lord and Savior. A cultural Christian will cherry-pick the parts of Christianity that they will have and use rather than, uh, you know, the parts that define a biblical Christian. For example, they would choose the good works of Jesus and reject all those parts that define a biblical Christian. The cultural Christian considers themselves Christian based on a number of things, possibly family, background, social condition, uh, country of origin, or even country of residence. And there's a whole list that we can go through. And if one does a, a thoughtful examination of the current North American Christian culture, we find that a gospel is being presented today that is an addition to one's life. It's not seen as Jesus would say it. It's just an addition. Just add the gospel to the list of hobbies you have. Just add giving, for example, to the poor of your list of good deeds, and hopefully the good deeds outweigh the bad things. Friends, of course the Bible teaches that Jesus is Lord of all things. He's the Lord of all creation. He's the Lord of the unbeliever, the Lord of the believer. But in our current context, when the gospel is presented, people simply go through the motion of accepting Jesus, but really, in many ways, have no intention of surrendering to his lordship. Instead of obeying Jesus when he said to his disciples, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. The cultural Christian has no interest in abiding in Jesus. Well, the same commentator who helped us define cultural Christianity gives us some of the identifying marks of cultural Christianity. And let me, and let me give you four quick ones. One, a cultural Christian denies the inspiration of the Bible. Two, a cultural Christian accepts or even celebrates ongoing sin while claiming to know God. Three, a cultural Christian redefines biblical truth to accommodate the culture. And four, a cultural Christian denies or minimizes Jesus' claim that he is the only way to God. But folks, I want to bring this a little closer to home, a little closer to us. Can I ask you, are you pursuing the things of this world? In other words, do you love the things of this world more than you love Jesus? Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 2, verse 15 and 17, he said, Do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Then he went on to say, And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Why do you go to church? Why do you give your money to the poor? Is it for appearance sake? Got to keep up with the Joneses? The Joneses family at church? Friends, the Bible teaches that this kind of religion, or this kind of religious attitude, is a form of religion that is powerless, unable, to change your life or my life. The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to his dear friend and, and co-worker Timothy, said that many would become lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, and he carries on this long list. But Paul's point is this, that these people had a form of godliness but denied its power. So what did they need? Well, friends, they needed repentance of their sins. And they needed the power of the Holy Spirit to sanctify them and, and guide them through life and to bring more holiness to their life. Well, how about this one? Are you all about the rules? Are you all about the rules? Or as our culture is frantically pursuing in these days, good morals or morality. Friends, rules or good morals can never change the human heart, the sinful human heart. Only the word of God is revealed to a person by the power of the Holy Spirit can bring repentance to a person. That, my friends, can change the heart of sin 
to a heart of righteousness, a heart of holiness, a heart pursuing Jesus, pursuing, as Jesus said to his Jewish audience, audience, pardon me, the will of my Father who is in heaven. Well, let's go to verse 14 again. Let's read this verse together as we're bringing this to a close. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. When one reads through Matthew's gospel concerning Jesus' ministry and his message, it should become apparent very soon that Jesus had a lot to say about the difficulty of following him. And just for an example, let's turn to Matthew chapter 10. And we'll take a look at there. And we see at the beginning of the chapter that Jesus had called his 12 disciples and even lists them all there. And he gave them the authority to cast out uh, demons and to heal every disease. And then he sent them out into the Jewish countryside with the message of repentance and the gospel. He warned them that he was sending them out as sheep in the midst of wolves. He prepared his disciples and told them to have no fear of anyone. And he said to them, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. He reminded them that those who acknowledged Jesus before men, that he would acknowledge them before his Father in heaven. But he also said, if anyone denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. You see this in Matthew chapter 10, just read through it. Jesus also said this message would bring a sword, not peace, to the earth. Even if it would be possible, Jesus' message would divide families against each other. Yet even if this happened, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You see, friends, to lose one's life for Jesus' sake is to find life. The cultural Christian is not interested in losing their life. The Jewish religious leaders and many Jews of Jesus' days, they were not interested in losing their life. I have become convinced by this text alone that there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Someone who calls themselves a Christian and in name only and lives a life that's opposite to the commands of Jesus is no Christian at all. No, these are people, and there are millions on this path today, who have chosen the gate which is wide, and the way in that way, the way that is easy, I mean, the way that can only lead to, as Jesus said, destruction. Friends, the way of Jesus is hard, but it leads to life, and few find it. The way of Jesus is by grace alone, by faith alone. The way of Jesus is repentance and submission to Jesus. The way of Jesus is a willing heart to obey the will of God and his holy Bible. The way of Jesus is hard, but it leads to life. Father, thank you. Thank you for your message to us today. Thank you, Lord, that you have sent your Son, your one and only Son into this world, for you love the world that whoever believes on him would receive eternal life. He didn't send him to condemn the world, for the world stands condemned already. Love drove, love sent Jesus to this world, and we thank you, Lord. These are hard things we've heard today. Help us, O Lord, to surrender to your Spirit's uh, movement in our hearts and minds, that we would be obedient to the commands of our Lord and Savior, Jesus that it would bring you great glory in all these things, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless, friends. Shalom.